Hi and welcome to this week's Wu Wei Wisdom Life Lessons Teaching. It's great to be back with you all. This week we are talking all about inherited beliefs. You'll discover where they come from and the many ways in which they impact the decisions you make in all aspects of your life. Most importantly, you'll learn how you can identify, question and change these beliefs so you can be much more true to yourself. Okay, David, so let's start with some definitions. What exactly are inherited beliefs? Well, I think this is very important, Alex, because it touches on what we also call the inner child. And they're beliefs that we gather from our childhood. So they can be from mainly our family, mainly our parents is in our family, but they could be the grandparents or the extended family. It could be culture, could be religion, or it could be experiences that happen to you when you were a child. And what you're doing then is you're kind of developing a series of beliefs. Now, I like to use the word program, and a lot of my clients don't like that word, but it's almost like you're programming yourself with these beliefs. So, and when you say the inner child, what we're referring to here is the part of our mind, of our psyche, of our subconscious thinking that... um, forms in childhood, as you just said, through our childhood experiences, what we learn from our family, our teachers, the people, important people in our life, and that we then carry through into adulthood. And I guess what you're saying is the inner child beliefs are essentially the thing that we carry through, these, these, this programming. This is so important, Alex. I can't emphasise the importance of this. Because these beliefs are formed normally around the age gap of six years old and nine years old. Not exactly that time, but around that time. We're like a sponge and we just gather it all in. For instance, if your mother is a warrior, and this is why it can be so difficult to spot because it's so subtle the way it comes into your belief system. Yeah, and and as a child, we... So these aren't genetically Mm. inherited. It's inherited through observation, Uh, either indirect observation of our parents or direct teachings. So if our mother is a warrior or an anxious person, she may directly say to you, uh, you know, don't do that. It's da- it's dangerous, or this is a dangerous place, or the world is dangerous, or or you can observe that by how she reacts to things. The belief that she holds that the world's a scary and dangerous place, that she's not going to be able to cope with this danger or these problems or this unpredictability, and that we either directly or indirectly copy and take on board those sort of beliefs from, say, our mother. That's right, Alex. But you know, there's an even more subtle and important situation that we're talking about with this family environment. It's what we see and what we hear and what we learn, because it might be a direct teaching. You know, religion, for instance, is a direct teaching. But it can be something even more subtle. It's what we perceive. So if something is happening, say, for instance, we have parents that are tied up in their own lives, their own situations, their own problems, their own emotions, we may perceive a belief is, oh, it's because they don't love me because I'm not good enough. They don't love me because I'm unlovable. I can't cope. And so it's it's another layer and it really forms the foundations of the Wu Wei wisdom model that you're looking at. These childhood beliefs, we don't write them down, we don't repeat them. They are so subtle and they come to us in those formative years, mm-hmm. those three, five, six years are very formative because they give you the bedrock 
the fountainhead, the first domino, whatever you want to call it, the foundation. But then they grow and then something really vital happens in our teenage years. It becomes our identity. We start to see ourselves as a warrior, as fearful, as the world's out to get us, as there's something wrong with us. And we start to believe it. It becomes our identity. And I think that that kind of extra step or that extra twist that you've just said is really important because for a lot of people, they may not be able to identify this uh, like a direct inherited belief or a direct copying of a belief, but it's the interpretation of what's happening in their world or interpretation of the message and how, what sort of a person they are in in relation to that as a, you know, as a younger person, that is, is what's inherited. It's like the interpretation twists everything. So I guess an example would be if you're brought up in a culture which is very much advocating family first rather than the individual looking after themselves and that, you know, you must sacrifice everything for your family regardless if that's the cultural norm, then if you don't meet that perceived standard or expectation that you believe, say, your parents have or your wider family have of you, then you twist that and then interpret it as, I'm a bad person, I'm not good enough, I'm not meeting this cultural <laughs> or family standard, you know, I'm I'm a lesser person because of it. So that's also in inherited from almost like the family or the cultural waters that you are born into. And that's why this can be so complicated, Alex, because I can even put another layer on, on it, not to overcomplicate mm -hmm. it, but it's what we call the emotional pendulum. So you can be in a situation that you can see it's dysfunctional, and you can't deal with that because obviously you're too young and you're reliant on your family or your parents. So you do the opposite. You say, I'll show them. I'll never do that. Or you may say, if that's what they think they are, then I'll be that. And this is why this inherited belief in our inner child mind is so important to understand as complicated as it is, because it has many layers, you have to take the time to deconstruct. When I'm working with my clients, that's what I'm trying to do, help them deconstruct so they can understand. And I say on many of these teachings, say to my clients all of the time, take this away, write this down now. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And it's the why that it's so important and we're going to talk about because that's what we call the golden thread. That's how you unpick, deconstruct these complicated weaving of your family, your school, maybe being bullied, maybe a poor teacher, could be lots of things that have kind of very kind of soaked into your psyche, if you like, and you've never sat down and made a decision. You've never said, oh, yes, I am going to be like my mother. That's really good. Or my yeah. mother says I'm not good enough. That must be true, mustn't it? Yeah, and I think this is the the thing I, I wanted to make a point about before we move on to looking at how we undo this. I think if we have inherited beliefs or misinterpreted or kind of self-manipulated beliefs based on childhood experiences along the lines of I'm not good enough, I can't cope, I'm unlovable, the world's a dangerous place, uh, the world's and everyone else is out to get me, I need to protect myself. If they're the sort of beliefs that the our inner child part of our mind is holding on to and then driving our life with in adulthood, we don't all of a sudden think, oh, the problem here, the reason why I'm having problems in my relationships or problems with my career or problems with my finances is because of my inherited beliefs. No, nobody says that. They have 
I guess they, the starting point is an emotional, the higher level emotional discontent. They feel the inner conflict that something is not right internally with my thinking. They feel it through their feelings first, through their emotions. They don't immediately, in terms of the clients who come to you, they don't say, I've got a problem with my inherited beliefs. Mm -hmm. It starts with the emotions because of the internal conflict that these beliefs are creating. That's right, Alex. And that's why I believe that what I call red light feelings, you may want to call anxiety, fear, being scared, being overwhelmed. I believe those red light feelings are like a red light. They're telling you there's something misaligned in your thinking. And I would go deeper than your thinking to your beliefs. That program, and as we've just explained, that program for many of us has been developed and inherited from our childhood. And let me say one thing. This is why I find with my clients, when we get down to those core beliefs, they're not even their own beliefs. Have you ever thought about that? Do you actually believe that to be true? And we have a little test. And I'm going to give you this test. When you say something to yourself, like, I'm not good enough, I can't cope, I'm unlovable, would you say that to your physical child? We call it the Shen test, because that's testing your spirituality. And I would say, without doubt, the things you say to yourself, you would not say to your physical child. Why? Because they're ridiculous. They don't make sense. And that's really why you've got to get to those core beliefs. Because there's something even more important here. Because that core belief where I call it the vow, V-O-W, there's something wrong with me, there's something missing in me, that really affects your spirituality. That affects who you are as a divine spiritual person because you're doubting your own worth and your value that we call Shen. And when you doubt your own worth and value, as Alex has just rightly explained, many years later, you can be experiencing anxiety with relationships, with work, with friends, with life, and you are focusing on the emotions instead of focusing on the beliefs that create the emotions. Mm -hmm. Remember, the emotions are always the consequence of what you believe. You see something, you perceive it, you create an emotion. And, and similarly, just to kind of explain our model, the, the issue comes here, the we experience the red light emotions as a consequence of believing something. I'm not good enough. I can't cope. I'm unlovable. The world's a horrible place because that is not the truth. And that greater part of us that you've just referred to, which in the Wu Wei wisdom model and Taoism is called Shen, our spirituality, our authentic essence. That Shen knows that those inherited beliefs are not the truth. And it's that conflict of what we deeply know to be true and what our inner child or our mind is telling us the opposite, that pulling apart that conflict is what creates the uncomfortable, painful emotions. So they are a very useful signpost to tell us that something is not right here. And that's when, as you say, that's when we really need to go and look at the source of the problem because the source of the problem is not the uncomfortable, painful emotions. It's the deeper inherited beliefs. Because when we shift our beliefs to something that is authentic and true to us, 
So not other people's beliefs about how we should be as a, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a brother, a sister, a friend, but the beliefs that we are true and authentic to us when we create that kind of alignment with our shen, our spirituality, the consequence is green light feelings of inner peace, of calm, of contentment, of joy, of inspiration. So again, the emotions are doing a brilliant job as an indicator. Are our beliefs true to ourselves and who we really are, or are they in conflict with our inner truth? That's such a profound teaching, Alex, because the problem doesn't lie in the current circumstances, whether that's being made redundant, whether that's a breakup in a relationship, whether that's ill health. That's not the problem. The real problem is internally, as Alex has just explained, this is the profound teaching. And a lot of my clients say, well, if I do this, the problem is not going to be solved, is it? No, because we do not live in a reality where we do not face issues, problems, movement, change. This is the reality we live in. But what it does do, as Alex has just explained, it connects you to a much deeper inner strength, an essence, a spirituality that connects to your resilience, connects to your creativity. So when you're faced with a problem, you can find a way to resolve, ride above the waves, like a, like a surfer riding the waves. You can't stop the problems, the issues, the challenges, because that's the reality that we live in. But what we're talking about is giving you the resources that you already have to be able to mount those challenges and to learn and to grow. And that's why we call these teachings life lessons, because we're constantly getting life lessons. And we have to re refer to this deeper spiritual knowledge, this inner knowing that we have to deal with those lessons, because the truth is everything you've faced in your life, everything you have coped, you're a coping machine. You will always cope. And we're just talking about how you cope, how you cope in flow, in Wu Wei, to your best ability, reaching your potential, standing tall, feeling that energy inside of you. This is what these teachings are all about. And you already have it. No one can give it to you. It's already there. It's just accessing that inner power. And David, are you saying that we'll face challenges, we'll face upheaval and uncertainty in our life, but we can cope far better with it if we are internally aligned with our truths and our true beliefs and our authentic self, rather than trying to deal with life when we have this an inner conflict between our true self and inherited beliefs. It's almost like we're on the back foot already. Well, that's right, because as you said, Alex, and you explained it very, as very well, when you have this internal conflict, it's like a tug of war. Have you felt this? You kind of know what you should do, but this voice is telling you no. It's unfamiliar. Let me stick to the familiar. I can't challenge myself. Uh, I'm worried about what people think about me. How about if they don't like me? How about what society thinks? And so you have this inner conflict. So instead of focusing on your journey, because your journey is unique and amazing, you are awesome. There is no doubt about it. And if you cringe when I say that, why? There is no one in the universe like you. Look around, family, friends, no one like, like you. No one has your knowledge and experience. No one has your inner strength and resilience. And if you're pushing back when I say that, then this teaching is for you because you are doubting your innate 
worth and value. And so as Alex says, these challenges will come. I'm going to guarantee you there will be difficulties in your life. How do you face them? You face them standing tall, connecting to that inner resolve, that resilience. This is who you are, not this kind of, oh, I can't cope. Oh, I can't be accountable. Oh, I can't be responsible. I want a magic person to come and sort out all my problems. This is fairyland. And this is why spirituality is not something that's supernatural. Your spirituality is natural. It's part of who you are. And David, when we um, encounter these life challenges or difficult situations, and that then feeds into our thinking, you know, how are we going to respond to this? This is when there's the it they hits the conflict with any misaligned inherited beliefs we may have. Then we experience the red light emotions. I think would you say that that's a the best time to start to recognize and then start picking apart and examining? Hold on a minute. Why am I responding like this? Why am I being? Why am I? emotions being triggered why am I creating these emotions to begin the process of being mindful of critical thinking of self-inquiry of questioning what are the driving beliefs here that are creating my emotional reaction that's right Alex you know so I would say we call it in our model the golden thread process. And this is something you can do for yourself. As Alex has just explained, critical thinking, self-inquiry. Once you agree, and here's the key, do you agree that you are the creator of your emotions, not the victim? I'm not saying you shouldn't create emotions. I am not saying emotions are wrong. I'm saying the opposite. Emotions are natural, normal, make us human, but emotions don't float around the room and attack you. Other people don't make you feel. Have you ever said that? He makes me feel. She makes me feel. No, you make you feel. So I would always start, as Alex has just explained, when you get those red light emotions, and then you say, why do you call them red lights? Because if you say anxiety, you start to identify yourself. Oh, I am anxious. You are not anxious. You create anxiety. See the difference? You're not the victim Mm -hmm. of anxiousness. So start at the top, call them a red light, and then just ask yourself, I am now experiencing a red light feeling. What's the thought? Why? Remember what I said? What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And very quickly, when you do that self-inquiry, that critical, radical thinking, I'm creating this because I believe I can't cope. Okay, why do you believe you can't cope? Now, you see how this is so easy. Well, I believe I can't cope because I've never coped. Why haven't you been able to cope when the evidence is just being alive? You've always coped. Well, and then people start, and then I hear this all the time. Do you say this? I don't know. When I ask them, oh, why can't I? I don't know. So you do something and you don't know why you do it. And we have set up in our mind barriers that we have to get through. Many people write to us in our communities, I can't do the golden thread, I get stuck. And this is the reason. When I ask the question, oh, so why can't you do that? I don't know. Well, you must know because you've just told me you can't do it. Yes, but I don't know. And then you that's the carousel of despair that you have to break through because you have to be accountable. If you have to believe then you have to be accountable. And once you can get that pass through that barrier, I will almost guarantee you it'll go right back into your childhood and it will be something like what my parents said to me. So just had a client just two days ago, their parents said to me, 
you'll never be as good as your brother. Now tell an eight-year-old that. And that, now he accepted it. Now he could have gone the other way and said, I'll prove to you, but he accepted it. And then that was his foundation. And then he built his belief system on that foundation. And then what happens? They cherry pick. So when something doesn't go the way they want it to, they go, oh, well, that's evidence. That's proof. Or his brother does something, well, I'll never be as good as him. And then they build this illusion and then it becomes their identity. Mm. And David, would you say, I can imagine that if people have spent decades of their late childhood, teens, adult life, building their belief system their, and their identity and their personal story and their life on inherited beliefs, of course it's a good thing to question and to change them and to realign to our truth, but would you say it's also very destabilizing to do that because you've you've made yourself into a person that you're not and then when you decide to be <clears throat> true to yourself that's going to impact a lot of things it's going to impact family dynamics it's going to impact relationships it's going to impact questioning if you, if you're in the right career all sorts of things. How how do we deal with that internally? Well, that can happen, you know, Alex. But in, in my experience, that these things, once you can get this belief structure right, your programming right, and once you get your dialogue right, and once you get your wording right, and then it's almost like a readjustment. You start to readjust. The image that's come to mind as I'm explaining this is like, like a guitar string. If the guitar is out of tune, you can still play it and you can still understand the tune. But when you make those slight adjustments and bring yourself into an alignment, into a harmony, then life becomes actually easier. Now, all the things you've described, having then to readjust maybe your career, let's use that one, well, that now becomes something for you that's very exciting. Yeah. That you something you realise, again, just a couple of days ago, I was speaking to a client who's doing this work, and I said, I've realised I'm not in the right career. Now the thought of restudying, learning a new career, expanding themselves, doing something they would really create a good feeling of love for, doesn't become a drudgery. It becomes a release. It's like someone's taken a big weight off your shoulders. The reason why? Because you're in your flow. You're in your wu way. You're living your truth. You're being true to yourself. And then those, as Alex has just explained, they kind of just realign around you. And yes, you may lose some friends, but would you call them friends if somebody doesn't really want you to be true to yourself? Are they a real friends? I would say you'll gain even stronger friendship and relationship if you're true to yourself and you let go of the inherited beliefs and take accountability for your beliefs. And David, I would imagine as well for, say, family members uh, who we may have learned these beliefs from, let's just use the example of the anxious mother, we're not then, it's not then about seeking to change their mm -hmm. worldview or their beliefs, no. that's, that's their journey. Yeah. And I guess if we change our beliefs, our, our worldview, then there is possibly a point of conflict there with you know, certain family members. But I have a sense that when we have, when we hook into our true identity and our true worth and our true life direction, that becomes the most important thing. So what other people think of us, what our parents' opinion of us, still matters but it matters less than being true to ourselves and that's what becomes the guiding light in our life i think the word guiding light is a good word alex i think that you have to get down to that core value the vow 
I need the vow for you, there is something wrong with me. Or is that vow for you that I am awesome? I'm no more awesome than anybody else. We're all awesome. This is not about being special or being superior or being inferior. You have a uniqueness. And this is really what this life lesson is about. You come through periods in your life, childhood, teenage years, young adult, marriages. The thing that's constant is your Shen, your spirit. And really the life lesson is connect to that. Be at one with that. Trust yourself and really believe in your absolute uniqueness. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And be clear on that simple teaching on this life lesson. This is what I believe, David. This is why I believe it. And make sure then ask yourself, would I teach this to my child? Wonderful. Thank you, David. And I will put links in the show notes to another long form teaching we have done on the childhood vow, which David has mentioned, as well as a link to our golden thread process video playlist, which has lots more teachings on there to help you understand the process of self-inquiry that David does with all his clients and how you can manage your emotions and manage your beliefs so you can live a much more authentic life. I really hope you have enjoyed this teaching. Do let us know. And if you have worked on inherited beliefs, identified them or changed them, tell us about your journey. How have you experienced it and what have been your successes? We'd love to hear from you. David works every week with clients all over the world via Zoom video call on exactly these sorts of issues. If you'd like to learn more about David's one-to-one consultations, I will put a link to those in the show notes as well. And finally, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We produce new long-form teachings every Saturday, as well as two midweek short snippets of wisdom for you to enjoy. So do subscribe. We look forward to sharing with you again very soon. Bye-bye.